Um, tonight is um, February 12th, Sunday night, um, Dan and Veronica's class. So anyway, we'll get started. There's a lot of um, material, and um, so I'll skip through it kind of quickly. Levi Zyko, next. My speaker's talking to me. Um, hold on. Sometimes the equipment takes over your life. It's like, like leave me alone. You Sorry, turn, guys. Be patient with this. <laughs> this Bluetooth, it's that Bluetooth. Levi Zyko, next. Disconnected. So anyway, uh, tonight we're going to deal with... Um, we're going to deal with all my technical stuff. So I think you guys can see the um, <clears throat> high, high impact and generosity uh, slide. Yes. And, um, oh man, it's like really, leave me alone. Um, so we're going to deal a little bit, well, a lot with homelessness and trauma. And so those are pretty heavy duty subjects and, um, you know, trauma can spill into um, things like, um, you know, shame and insecurity and um, a worthlessness, things like that. And so this, what I'm going through tonight could be a whole course in itself. And um, so we just wanted to kind of give you an overview uh, because we think that trauma probably has a lot to do with homelessness, and that's kind of how they tie together. So the first question is, homelessness in the United States getting better or worse? And if you've kind of tracked in our class, sometimes um, we think everything is getting worse. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of things are getting a little bit better. <laughs> and the, the answer for homelessness is getting a little better in the longer term and a little worse in the shorter term. So I think uh, part of um, probably some of the increase was probably because of COVID and um, just the effects of COVID. And then California is leading the way as usual um, on stuff that um, it's nothing to be real proud of that we're the ones that lead in homelessness. I think 30% of all homeless are reside in California. Before I go on further though, um, I have I still have this cup. Did anybody find a Kiva substitute member? Kiva, you guys, you guys caught me. Cause because you guys actually checked up on the on the tax return. And so you caught me with a high salaried person and more than the the allotted, at least what we think is the allotment. So I have this really cool cup. That I guess I still have this really cool cup because I guess nobody found it. Kiva, there is I, one. I looked up several several of them, but I, um, that do the same thing. But I didn't take the time yet to to check out if they are better or if they're right right around the same thing. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking. <laughs> okay, you still got a chance. Yeah, I looked up several of them, but the thing is, they don't work. Like the Kiva website is so much more nicer because you could look at the you could see the people you can do all the things but these right. websites don't have that kind of going right. for them right and it's like i said sometimes you find out stuff and you're not because of what some of what we teach you go oh really but but then to try to find somebody better is not always easy but they, there's uh, i think we have one or two out there i just want to see if anybody found it since i neglected to find that out right away. Um, so back to the lesson, best, uh, California is much worse. Um, here's a chart. The, the charts that are out there, most of them stop at 2018. There's not much information that I could find for uh, 19 and 20. And so basically it's like we were saying in the long term, it's trending from 2007 over 10 years, it trended down and then it flattened out uh, in 2017. And the, the, this is the sheltered. And this is the, the gray is sheltered and the green are unsheltered people. Some I'm sure people float between the two of them. We're going to talk a little bit about trauma and um, 
trauma, the reason we tie these two subjects together is we do think they're kind of related. Um, and so <clears throat> trauma, trauma is um, something that leaves a lasting imprint on the brain. And there's been a lot of studies done over the last 20 years on trauma. And um, I think there's a lot more recognition of the issues that trauma causes in, in people's lives. <clears throat> One of the things, um, you know, at Power Plus where I work, um, you get people sometimes that um, are late for work, miss work, uh, have a lot of issues. And sometimes um, as management or managers, you can be kind of tough on people. Uh, because you have to run, you have to be somewhat consistent with people, but you also have to learn that people are individuals. And so sometimes we think that if you understand a little bit of what's going on in the background, uh, at least it gives you a little more sens sensitivity to maybe why there's some of the behavior that there is. Um, people affected by trauma can be re-traumatized in reaction to a conversation that seems harmless to most people. And so um, I have two foster grandkids and I've come to appreciate a lot more of, um, not, not appreciate trauma for trauma, but appreciate understanding just the, the long road of recovery that a lot of foster kids have, because as, uh, sometimes as infants, they're really um, badly, um, there's a lot of violence, there's a lot of neglect. Um, and so there's just a lot at, at a young age just really puts an imprint on their brains. I'm going to show you a video. It's a little bit um, long, but uh, in the videos I give you, um, I try to balance and give you liberal points of view on some things and conservative points of view on some things. So, um, so I know we have a mixed bag because any group has a mixed bag. I just I try to let you know that I try to um, be as balanced as I can because there's always good there's always good stuff in maybe the position you don't have that helps you, I think, understand maybe the position, uh, but also it opens your mind to uh, different things. So anyway, let me uh, cue us up here if I can find my stuff here. And uh, let me go over, whoopsie. Let me go find my, let me go find my movie. Oh, there we go. I had a big Zoom meeting this afternoon because I'm kind of zoomed out. But you can't zoom out because that's what we all do these days. The most important thing to... You guys picking up the audio okay? Good. No, is that there's a difference between trauma and stress. As I like to say to people, life sucks a good amount of the time. We all have jobs and situations that are really unpleasant. But the moment that the situation is over, it's over. The problem with trauma is that when it's over, your body continues to relive it. My name is Bessel van der Kolk. I'm a psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and author of the book, The Body Keeps Its Core. I got interested in trauma on my first day working at the Veterans Administration. 1978 was the year, and the Vietnam War was over by about six or seven years. The very first day that I met Vietnam veterans, I was just blown away. These were guys who were my age, who were clearly smart and competent and athletic, and they clearly were just a shadow of their former self their bodies were clearly affected by trauma and they had a very hard time connecting with new people after the war. Around that time, a group of us started to define what trauma is. And in the definition of PTSD, we write 
These people have been exposed to an extraordinary event that is outside of normal human experience. In retrospect, that shows us how ignorant and narrow-minded we were. Because it turned out that this is not an unusual experience at all. People usually think about the military when they talk about trauma. But at least one out of eight kids in America witness physical violence between their parents. A larger number of kids get beaten very hard by their own caregivers. A very large number of people in general, but women in particular, have sexual experiences that were clearly unwanted and that left them confused and enraged. So unlike what we first thought, trauma is actually extremely common. There's a lot of debate of what a trauma is to this day. But basically, trauma is something that happens to you that makes you so upset that it overwhelms you. There is nothing you can do to stave off the inevitable. You basically collapse in a state of confusion, maybe rage, because you are unable to function in the face of this particular threat. But the trauma is not the event that happens, the trauma is how you respond to it. One of the largest mitigating factors against getting traumatized is who is there for you at that particular time. When, as a kid, you get bitten by a dog, it's really very scary and very nasty. But if your parents pick you up and say, Oh, I see that you're really in bad shape. Let me help you. That dog bite doesn't become a big issue because the foundation of your safety has not been destroyed. We are profoundly interdependent people. And as long as our relationships are intact, by and large, we're pretty good with trauma. It's a subjective experience and what may be traumatic for you may not be traumatic for me, depending on our personality and our prior experiences. The problem with trauma is that it starts off with something that happens to us, but that's not where it stops, because it changes your brain. Much of the imprint of trauma is in that very primitive, survival part of your brain that I like to call the cockroach brain. There's a part of you that just picks up what's dangerous and what's safe. And when you're traumatized, that little part of your brain, which is usually very quiet, continues to just send messages. I'm in danger. I'm not safe. That event itself is over, but you continue to react to things as if you're in danger. We are talking about survival. We are talking about staying alive. And so some people go into fight flight, or on a more primitive level, people's brain shuts down and they collapse. You have these automatic responses that are not a product of your cognitive assessment, they're a product of your animal brain trying to stay alive in the face of something that that part of your brain interprets as a life threat. And the problem then becomes that you are not able to engage or to learn or to see other people's point of view or to coordinate your feelings with your thinking. Traumatized people have a tremendous problem experiencing pleasure and joy. But the core issue is our hormones and our physiological impulses that have to do with survival. Your body keeps mobilizing itself to fight. You have all kinds of immunological abnormalities, endocrine abnormalities, and that really devastates your physical health also. Oftentimes the physical problems are longer lasting than the mental problems. And the other thing that is terribly important is the impact of poverty 
or the impact of racism or the impact of unemployment. There are other societies that are much more trauma savvy than we are. Where there is not an enormous amount of income inequality, healthcare is universal, childcare is universal. A culture like that really looks at what are the antecedents for certain forms of pathology. So the big issue is a political issue. How do we rearrange our society to really know about trauma so that people who grow up under extreme adverse conditions can become full-fledged members of society? The sense of community and people being there for each other is a critical part of surviving and thriving. Get smarter faster with new videos every week from the world's biggest thinkers. So that gives you a little bit of a uh, overview of the subject of trauma. And um, I think he kind of spells it out kind of nicely. It's something that uh, affects our brains and affects um, affects everybody in, in certain uh, situations. And uh, so anyway, I, I really kind of like how he lays that out. Let me get... Can I, can I, can I say ahead. something? His, I highly recommend his book, The Body Keeps Score. It's phenomenal. So I think for anyone, it, it, yeah, it's a great book. I think it's helpful as we look at all the different factors that create trauma from poverty to racism to, you know, abuse and so many other factors that it, it, it influences people's health, as the author mentioned. It also impacts their cognition, their ability to learn and access to education. And it also impacts their behavior, the way that they behave because of the way that the, the hormones are um, dispersed in their body and in their brain, that it, you know, this is, this is the area I work in. I work in cognitive neuroscience. And so I work uh, particularly with schools. And so, you know, so many teachers right now are struggling because behavior problems are over, like off the charts, like never before seen so bad behavior problems in classrooms right now. And that is just a result of the trauma and the chronic stress that we have experienced over the last um, three years um, in the ongoing pandemic and how we just haven't really dealt with it properly. Um, and so, it, yeah, it's just recognizing that it impacts their their brain cognitively, their bodies health-wise, as well as their behavior and how they just interact with other people. I also agree, I agree with you of reading the book um, the body keeps restore. I read it through last year, but it is like, uh, it is really trauma heavy. So if you like are going through like stuff that like haven't been speaking to a counselor or anything, I don't recommend it right away. Um, but it is, it is a good book. All right. Good comments. Thank you. Um, the, there's a, um, that, <clears throat> You know, so so sometimes you discover there's problems and, and trauma is a problem. So how do you learn to um <clears throat> how do you learn to assess? How do you learn how to deal with it? There's a um a, a test that's out there called ACE, <clears throat> and and they've developed it over the last um 20 or 30 years, and they try to define ways of measuring um trauma in people's lives because there's different levels of trauma. Uh, in in people's lives, different manifestations of trauma, um, you know, just different things like that. Um, I'm going to show you a set of slides, and if you, um, we're always really sensitive to people, and I'm going to go through them pretty quickly. Sometimes just showing people um, the test kind of sets them off a little bit, and so um, I probably won't have you score yourself. But um, if I do, if you want to score yourself, feel free. Uh, but if you don't want to score your in quotes, score yourself. I uh, don't feel like you have to. Um, the, the questions one to five, when you were a child, here's some of the questions. Was a family member incarcerated? Was a, fa was a family member an alcoholic or drug abuser? Was a family member mentally ill or attempted suicide? 
Uh, did you experience the loss of a parent either through divorce, death, or adoption, fostering? And one was one of your parents physically abused by the other? And uh, so those are the <clears throat> some of the questions that um, deal with your childhood. My two, my daughter, my experience has been very. You, you know, I'm not an expert on this by any by any stretch. I teach it, but uh, I'm you know I don't do it full time, and I'm I'm not a professional. But my two foster kids uh, that my daughter took in, you know, scored four of these out of five. So. The, you know, it kind of woke me up to the fact that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that are going on out there that I don't know about because I'm very fortunate. Um, here's some more questions, six to ten. <clears throat> Were you physically abused often or very often? Um, Were you often humiliated or insulted by a parent? And I, was, I think that can also be... Um, uh, an older sibling, because sometimes what happens is, at least with my foster son, was his older sister became like his mom, and so she was abusive to him. Were you touched in a sexual way by someone more than five years older than yourself? Did you often go hungry or have to wear dirty clothes? Did you often feel that no one in your house thought you were important, uh, emotional? You know, that's a sign of emotional neglect. <clears throat> a lot of times in our lives, I think that bottom one is like nobody at my work thinks I'm important. Or, you know, nobody in my house or my wife or my husband or my, you know, don't think I'm important. So that one, uh, in a lot of ways, can touch all of us. So what they what the distribution on the scoring was out of those questions uh, was um, oh as, as people that had zero of those instances was thirty six percent and then uh, four or more was twelve uh, percent. So that's kind of the uh, the different ranges of scoring. And um, here you can see somebody that scores six or more of those uh, questions um, is going to have a more high instance of homelessness, and so it kind of weaves its way down by the by the um, number of of, of uh, items that they score on. Uh, but it, it seems to be a correlation uh, between trauma and, and homelessness, at least to a certain extent. Uh, people that these are some. Some pretty sobering stati statistics. Uh, people who scored more than four compared to zero were um, three times more likely to be diagnosed with bipolar disorder, uh, five times more likely to be diagnosed with chronic depression, um, six times more likely to abuse likely to abuse drugs, illicit drugs. Uh, 10 times more likely to attempt suicide. And so I think those are a lot of things that, um, you know, we've seen more of these days. People that scored, uh, this is the same uh, extension of the same slide. Um, people who scored four or more, 40% were more likely to drop out of high school. And if you remember a couple sessions ago, we we asked what was the biggest reason for poverty, and and the number one reason was they weren't uh, they didn't uh, graduate through high from high school. Twice as likely to be unemployed, three three times more likely to regularly miss work, four times more likely to have serious problems performing work. And so, really, the challenge is this, and part of it, especially the work part, is. Um, Let's say you understand trauma a little bit. You're a good manager and you really want to help people. You want to help them grow. You want to help them become better people, better workers. And really, the, and the challenge you run, you kind of run into is, and let's say you kind of sensed or you knew the score of one of your employees. The, the, the tough part as a manager is... Um, you have some elasticity as a manager. You can bend or stretch or whatever. Um, but sometimes you get to a point where um, 
to be somewhat to be consistent in the environment and to be legal. That's the other thing that happens is, um, you know, you have to be consistent. Sometimes you might be letting somebody go that you don't want to let go because you want to. And maybe they work really well and they miss they miss work maybe a little more than than is than is acceptable. Um, but because they're so good, they can usually overcome their lack of being there. And so it gives you, it gives you, it makes it really tough to manage people, but at least you have an idea of, you know, what could be going on. Um, the science behind the statistics, cortisol and adrenaline give us our fight or flight responses. <clears throat> These chemicals created by our body become toxic to our body after 20 minutes. People who live under prolonged chronic stress will see changes to their brain, their brain chemistry. And so the trauma just really affects um, affects the brain to a great degree. The amma, amma, amygdala, which controls fight or flight, gets separated from the frontal cortex, the front of the brain, which controls your logic and the body takes over. Uh, reactions sometimes don't make sense. They're not logical to observers because they don't involve logic. The logic has been disconnected in the brain in that person, and and so there's no connection. We have no choice in the way our body decides how to respond because um, the you know the chemicals have taken over. It's just because we're human beings. A double bind occurs when the caregiver, care, caregiver of a child, like the mom or dad, is also the traumatizer. The healthy cycle is one child has a need, two caregiver meets the need, and, and the child feels comfort. So it gets, it gets through the, uh, the trauma. When the caregiver does not meet the need or the care, caregiver meets the need, but with anger, fear or contradictory signals, the child is not comforted and, uh, and experiences more trauma. The brain experiences confusion that has lasting effects in chemistry and DNA. The child will develop a coping mechanism that lasts in some ways through adulthood because we all as human beings are, have coping mechanisms that let us survive, um, that keep us alive. And sometimes the coping mechanisms aren't super healthy, but it, 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 it at least keeps us going and keeps us alive. If I feel discomfort, I won't be comforted. And even in many healthy cycles, the, the brain doesn't learn. Your body, and I told you guys I'd be flying through this, so some of you may or may not agree with everything we're, we're putting on these, um, but I think the general sense is, is, um, is correct. Your body subconsciously mirrors the emotions of people you are in contact with. <clears throat> so if you're with a happy person, um, your body subconsciously mirrors that happy person. If you're with an angry person, the same thing. If you're with a sad person, the same thing. It may be a person crying. And so we tend to mirror some, to a certain extent, the people around us. It's why you smile when somebody smiles, when, somebody, when someone smiles. It's why you fold your arms when someone else, someone else does. It's why you yawn when somebody else does. It's why you have a reaction with, when watching a pain on TV. Our brains mirror trauma long before we develop reasoning skills. Trauma can be experienced in the womb and during childbirth. And um, infants feel anger, anxiety, and fear from their parents. They can, they can sense it. Generational impact of trauma. Parents with high ACE scores often resolve to stop the cycle. I have a niece that's trying to stop the cycle. My sister-in-law was um, scored pretty high in the ACE score. And so my, my niece uh, resolved to stop the cycle, but it's been a super hard battle for her. Uh, they they want to make sure their children don't experience these traumas. So why do many of these children have a high rate of anxiety or, or and or other issues? Uh, thanks to mirror neurons and modified DNA, parent trauma is, is often passed on to children, unfortunately. 
trauma-informed interactions. If you know ahead of time you were interacting someone with someone with a high trauma background, you might behave a certain way. Uh, and this is a little bit of uh, what I was speaking about as a manager in a business environment. You might have more patience. You might speak more gently and maybe more quietly. And you might give them more second chances. And so there's nothing wrong with doing this. Um, but again, the challenge in the work environment is to stay legal, and, um, but also to stay human and, and to, to try to help the, to try to help people that have, a, have had a lot of high trauma. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you two, two different life, two, two different worlds, I guess the way to put it, your work life and your home life. Uh, if you have healing at home, at work or home, and you have safe or healing at work or home, if you have healing going on in both places, if there's progress being made, if there's understanding, if there's, you know, if you're getting therapy or counseling, and if you're getting it from both places, then there's the best, that's obvious, that's your best chance of emotional growth. If you're unsafe at work or home and you have healing in the other environment, uh, you, you probably can survive. Uh, but there won't be a tendency to, to emotional growth. Work, work or home is safe, but not healing. Work or grow home is unsafe or dangerous. Uh, you start deteriorating. Uh, unsafe at work and unsafe at home. You're unsafe kind of everywhere. You spiral out emotionally. And um, your preference might or your choice might be homelessness. Any any um, quick comments on that? I know some of you are experts on that, and um, I wish we had a couple hours to um, to talk about it, but we don't. But go ahead. Uh, who had their hand up? Betty. Yeah. So we have a church in the, in Long Beach that they are we having a. In English, Spanish, and Kamai language. They actually have one lead by homeless people. And I have the opportunity to talk to one of them because I don't know anything about what is in the mind of the homeless. I thought it was people with mental problems who don't know how to work. But uh, he was telling me that some of these people is coming with a lot of trauma in their lives, like maybe the wife left them or the husband left them and they wasn't able to deal with that situation and that's how they got in the homeless situation. So uh, anyway, different kind of reasons. Guys who need to pay child support and they don't, they can make that much money working. And if they make a work, they need to pass most of their salary. So they decide just to be homeless. So anyway, it was kind of interesting to have a conversation with this guy and learn more about them. Yeah, it helps you understand people. When you listen, it's hard to listen, though, right? We all, we all want to talk. Any other comments? My speaker was off for a little bit. My speaker's like being goofy tonight. Um, so maybe you had a really great, smart comment, and I missed it. <laughs> I got a couple uh, experiences that I think are interesting. We I got to go in one program. We got to go to St. Quentin. And we got to speak with some uh, um, criminal psychologists, and they uh, this one guy had had studied serial killers, and what he found in studying the still serial killers that that virtually to a, to a person they were all physically or sexually abused or abandoned under the age of two. So he's, yeah. during brain development period if you have that kind of trauma it, it, it's it it is truly changing the way that your brain works permanently yeah. um it does some and, real damage and then another thing they showed us this was a fairly old uh, um study but they they had done study on uh, um chimps. yeah it was on chimps that uh, um that were in high stress environment or low stress environment when they were pregnant and uh getting back to uh, high cortisol levels 
uh, had effect on the development of, of not just the brain, but musculature and everything else. Um, so when they were in high, high stress, high anxiety environments, their brains were had smaller cortexes and larger amygdalas. As you, you talked about the amygdala. And then their bodies were uh, actually in the, in the high stress environment were more muscular and able. So basically, you were born to come out to, uh, and deal with, Impressive. yeah, to 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 be ready to fight in a high stress environment. So it it like you said it, it can happen. All this can happen even before you're born, and set you up for for uh, um, difficulty. So thank you. Good comments. One of the things it's been that really I depressing, like looking at all the ACEs studies and it's been replicated and some of the questions have changed over the decades since it was first, um, since the first correlation was made. And it's really sobering um, to listen to the two doctors who first came together, who first made the connection um, as medical professionals trying to understand why they were seeing um, the patterns they were seeing and I just, it always sticks with me, the quote from the the doctor who was up one late, one night late, up late one night as the data started coming in that really mapped this correlation between adverse childhood experiences and, um, and later in life effects around uh, like incarceration and, and health and mortality rates and everything. And he says, that he just sat there in front of his computer and he just sobbed. He just cried and he cried and he cried as he realized what was happening to these people because of what happened in their childhood. Um, but I think it's really important to remember, it's really easy to, to make like this direct correlation and to think that it's almost like a death sentence, that people who have really horrible childhoods um, and are exposed to things that no child should ever experience um to i don't know it's just it's a little bit easy to to put ourselves in a in a position of, of privilege or to look at them as like lesser than and it's important to realize that the the research the original aces research doesn't ask questions um that almost that that the author in the video clip they were showing was referring to like did you ha did you have a caring adult in your life it might not have been a parent you might have been abused by your parent, but did you have like a coach or a, a church youth leader who was a mentor to you, who cared for you? And so there's all these other factors that can help mitigate some of the impacts of those um, adverse childhood experiences. And I think that's where we, as those of us who have privilege, can come in and can use our generosity to help um, kind of like rebalance those scales. And, you know, in, in the world of neuroscience that I work in, it's, it's the science of neuroplasticity, which tells us that our brains are always changing, constantly changing, and that um, nothing's permanent. And one great mentor, one micro loan, you know, one, one anything, and especially repeated over time, can make a, a significant lasting difference and can really rewire the brain as well. And so um, I always say that neuroplasticity is the most hopeful discovery that we have made in the last two decades, three decades, that it, it can change. Things can change. Things can get better. People can, re people can have um, different levels of recovery. Um, my friend that, um, that the Super Bowl was tonight, one of my friends works for the um, Philadelphia Eagles. As, and uh, he studies the brain. He's called the brain doctor. And he studies how player, player. this isn't really related too much to this, although it's related to the brain. He's, he studies how people perform under pressure. And he can tell if skills are, are comparable or the same. He can tell which athletes will perform better under pressure depending on how they're wired inside their brain. The brain is very complicated. and um, But anyway... It's it's uh, there's a lot there. All right, there's lots here. So good comments, thank you. And uh, yes, there is hope. And um, 
I mean, there's some things they didn't talk about there, like getting fired, getting divorced, getting shamed, being in a war, you know, guys that are in wars, you know, one night, one day you're a nice guy, the next, you know, five months later, you're an animal killing people. And so, you know, there's, there's just all these factors that happen in people's lives that, that change who they are, at least for a certain amount of time. Okay, so uh, top reasons for homelessness. Uh, there's short-term homelessness. You know, people just have some bad luck, a job loss, uh, maybe a natural disaster. I think 10 days ago, there was a big bet up earthquake over in uh, Syria, in Lebanon, and that area of the world, and I think a whole bunch of buildings. Um, I, can't, I don't remember, I heard the number, but I can't remember. Maybe 500 buildings collapsed. And so that's, um, you know, that's why they're homeless is because of a natural disaster. Uh, medium term is transitional housing, family conflict. Um, you know, uh, teenagers sometimes can run away. And because there's some changes chemically, you know, when they become teenagers. Domestic violence, uh, recent incar incarceration. And then long term is um, permanent housing, substance abuse, and mental mental illness. Is it possible that our brains lead us into homelessness and substance abuse due to trauma? If so, how should this affect how we look at these problems, and how should this affect how we interact with people? So these are some in a way, some small suggestions, uh, solutions, or maybe, you know, some things to think about. But what's the best way to, for organizations to help these people? Stage one is is like in the earthquake, it's like give them food and water, just, you know, they want to keep, keep them alive. So you meet the immediate needs of food, first aid, shelter. Stage two is meet the practical needs of job training, rehab, et cetera. Um, and then stage three is provide the longer term healing for emotional and mental health issues, you know, counseling and coaching and mentoring and, and things like that. One of the things that we do in, for stage two is we help um, we, um, we we build we help build people's homes for them. We do some in Mexico and we do some where there's tornadoes and disasters in our country. Uh, last year, we had a group build um, a home in Kentucky for somebody that had, had totally lost their home. And so that's a way we practically help them. Um, it's harder for us on stage three just because we don't have the amount of time that we have. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not needed. And then we help in Mexico, uh, people coming up from southern Mexico uh, the area we help uh, the more at is is in uh, south of Ensenada a bit because um, people come up to go to try to get work in fields and things like that and they just don't have anything and the and the and the composition of the they come from kind of like jungles wet more humid climates up to a real dry arid climate and then they may have been a farmer where they came from and, and and where they come to they you know you can't farm so just different uh, different geography there's some generational shifts that we we think have happened from the 60s to the 80 uh kids used to have more free range childhoods that means they just were out there and um you know you just went out and came home when it was dark unchaperoned by adults uh, learning from life experiences, both good and bad. From the 1990s to the present, there's a rise in awareness of crime, especially directed at children. <laughs> uh, the rise in awareness of crime has become more prominent and the effort to rein children in and keep them safe. So because we're more aware, we hear about more instances of crime. Sometimes there's not actually more crime. It's just that we hear it more often. We hear, hear this the situations more often than we try to um, make things more safe. And, and it might be almost the same environment. It's just because you hear it more. There's a flight to safety in schools. Uh, dangerous place structures uh, have been removed. 
moderated recess play activities, anti-bullying and anti-violence, zero tolerance, uh, adoption, the religion of safety. And my experience a little bit on the religion of safety is car seats for babies. Like, like when I had kids, we had one car seat and that was it. It was like for, for five years or four years. Nowadays, they change this car seat every year. You can't even give away a car seat technically if it's over a year old. And I just think it's an overkill on safety. That's my opinion. The message is life is dangerous, which it is. And adults will protect you both from strangers and from other kids and from anything that makes you feel uncomfortable. Transitioning to adulthood, desire for continued overprotection from anything that makes us feel endangered. Protection from as actual physical harm to even words and ideas that make us feel uncomfortable. This fosters self-righteousness, close-mindedness, close moral crusades, and even hostility. And then also the death of critical thinking. The loss of critical thinking, the long-standing educational theory, don't teach students what to think, teach them how, how to think. Strong minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, weak minds discuss people. That's from Socrates. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. In other words, listen to the other person's position and, and um, doesn't mean you have to accept it, but it means you understand it. And, and this is disappearing in higher education. And what is the impact of this overprotective shift on young adults as they enter society as independent adults? They're less prepared to handle life, emotionally fragile, unable to cope with stress, and constantly seeking safe spaces, migration to either isolation or surrounding themselves with like-minded people or sometimes known as tribalism. Two quotes for discussion. A culture that allows the concept of safety to creep so far that it equates emotional discomfort with physical danger is a culture that encourages people to systematically protect one another from the very experiences embedded in daily life that they need in order to become strong and healthy. Teaching kids that failures, insults, and painful experiences will do lasting damage is harmful in and of itself. Human beings need, need physical and mental challenges and stressors or we deteriorate. In other words, sometimes you have to toughen up a little bit. The rise of tribalism. Tribe is a group of people that feel connected to each other in a meaningful way because they share something in common that matters to them. Um, uh, the group allows them to make the distinction of us and them. Tribalism is a pattern of attitudes and behaviors we tend to adopt when we become to when we come to identify with our own, with our tribes. And so a lot of that is you, you get in echo chambers. Like um, if you're on some social media, let's say clubs or sites or groups or whatever, a lot of times we go into our own tribe and we're echo chambers because we all agree on everything or for the most part. And, and what we encourage is to try to mix it up a little bit with people that are different than you and have opposite viewpoints and see world, the life in a different way. Tribalism is, can hurt people, oh, I'm sorry, hurting people can migrate to tribes and find safe places. Depending on the tribal identity, a person can find themselves first, further isolated from society can lead to greater difficulty integrating in society, great, greater, greatly facilitated by social media. And, you know, the, the battle for safety is even in, in giving university. Um, I wanted to do a trip to Lebanon, which I did, but I had so many people tell me not to go to Lebanon because it was dangerous. And I, I just sometimes I go, hey, let me tell you what, the whole world's dangerous. I said, it's, you just, I said, in the United States, uh, Lebanon, Syria, 
Vietnam, Colombia. Uh, Colombia's um, Veronica was on a Columbia trip, and there's a shooting right in front of them. Uh, so it just, you know, there's, there's to, to try to just light, live life safe is is that it, it's not realistic because every you can you can get you know I could have gotten a car wreck tonight coming back from San Diego, so you just have to um, be smart but uh, realize that you know life isn't safe. I've been giving you guys some encouragement to go on two of the Mexico trips we have, but you'd be surprised how many people won't go to Mexico with me because they, they're afraid. And I go, well, okay. But it's like, wow. You know, I know some people won't go overseas at all. I had a girl that worked for us at Power Plus. I used to, I, at Power Plus, I'm kind of like the GU evangelist. I, because I'm nobody's supervisor, I can encourage them to do GU with us and go on trips to places. And we had a girl that worked for us and she was really conservative, which is fine. Um, but she, she was so conservative, you know, she didn't want to ever go outside the country, go to Mexico with me or do anything like that. And she ended up getting killed riding her bicycle or bike on the way to work. And so my point is this, um, you can live as safe as you think you, you, you can, but um, there's no guarantees. And so I just encourage people, I go, hey, get out there and see what's going on. Uh, one of the biggest benefits of traveling is you learn a lot of what you have in our country, you know, where we live. There's, we have a lot. And I said to most Americans, um, we get real inward and we think the whole world's crushing us, which it sometimes is. But I said, man, you need to go some other places and see what's going on out there. Social media, our friend, right? Both the physical and election, electronic isolation from people we disagree with allow the forces of confirmation, bias, groupthink, and tribalism to push us still further apart. And so again, the, the there's a new thing on Twitter. It's called Spaces. And it's just anybody can um, create a space and just have a discussion about any topic. And um, but sometimes in those spaces, they have a, they have a hard time um, getting a variety of people. It's all the same, you know, they, they all think the same way. And so some of the guys that do the spaces try to invite the others, the other side in so they can hear, you know, a little bit of a variety on, on how people see the world. Children who have been social media natives practically all their lives easily become enraged at each other, prone to judgmentalism and pursue moral campaigns are stunned socially and cannot integrate well into adulthood because they've been on their phone all the time. And, um, let me, I don't know if my, um, Ronica, give me an audio test again, would you? Testing, testing. I think my speaker's going off tonight. Battery 80% connected to you. Can you hear me? Hello, hello? Testing. Yeah, I can hear now. My my Bluetooth's dropping tonight. Sorry. But if you guys said something, I missed it. I apologize. Any comments on all that? Because I rushed through it all and um, it's just a lot. Sometimes, you know, you might wonder what this has to do with generosity. And it's a question I ask, to be honest with you. Um, but I think it's it's kind of in a way to encourage you to identify people that need the most help you know, that that um, have greater needs than, than you do yourself. Okay, Ronica, can you still hear me? Yes. Ronica is making me teach tonight, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, yeah, that's why we love Ronica. Um, let's go back here. Six ways social media affects mental health. Uh, it's addictive. And I think all of us, you know, when you think about cell phones, like 10 years ago, none of us, maybe 15 years ago, had cell phones. And now everybody has one. And when you can't find your cell phone, you get all paranoid and panicky. 
Is that right? Am I right? I don't hear anybody say yes, but I am right. Um, it triggers more sadness, less well-being. We're always comparing our lives with others, and that's mentally unhealthy. Um, it can lead to jealousy and vicious cycle, spawning an undercurrent of rage and hatred. More friends on social media doesn't mean you really have more friends. It just means you know how to get likes. The strangers are interacting with our kids. One of our projects at Giving University, we did a, a video or a movie, whatever you want to call it, called Sextortion. And it's one that's it's a project that's getting in some of the schools. And um, it's the kids when they start dabbling in stuff they shouldn't be, uh, strangers start interacting in their lives and, and can take take hold of their lives and, and intimidate the kids, especially um, girls, and, and, and create great chaos. And some of them do very violent things to themselves. And so, um, you know, it's an issue. What do you guys think about phones and all that and all the social media stuff? Rondi, what do you think? Or yeah, yeah, what do you think, Rondi? Um I, you know, there's there's pros and cons to it. I would say there's probably more cons. And I think back to when I was in high school and there were no cell phones and uh, life was hard enough then. So I have a lot of compassion for youth in particular because it's hard enough as an adult with a cell phone to be disciplined and to turn it off and put it away and not get the apps and all that kind of stuff but teens it's really difficult so um yeah it's it's very tricky and yet at the same time I do see some good things coming out of it but I would say more it's hard yeah it's like a tool it's like any any tool that you can have Hey, Grant, what do you think? What's happening, Grant? How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. What do you think about um, phones and Well, TV I think TVs? especially nowadays. What do you think about TikTok? Well, I don't have to. Well, I don't use TikTok a whole bunch. I just use the Instagram reels. Okay. But um, I think especially now because, I mean, COVID switched everything to, you know, everybody was just at their homes. And so I think that caused a lot of people just to be on technology a lot more. Yeah. And that's how people, you know, get around and use things right now, these days, especially, you know, even school went online and everything. So I feel like, you know, people just, their health has been caused a lot by the technology. Um, that's that's what I've what I've seen especially. Yeah, one thing that's positive is these Zoom meetings actually work really well now. When we first started doing them, I mean, except for my my equipment, but uh, when we first started doing them, you know, we people had a hard time getting on, and they had a hard time doing the video. So everybody's a lot better at Zoom now. So that's the good news of COVID. Yeah. Right? Well, we're for all, me, we're all, we're all good at Zoom. Yeah, for me, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. Meetings all day long on Zoom now. Yeah, but the thing, what I feel like is, you know, so much time looking on the screen, it's kind right. of draining on the eyes. Right. And so, like, I feel like it's good that we have access to this technology and so much. But at the same time, you know, an extensive usage of the computers and all, you know, a lot of online meetings just constantly having it can be can be difficult a lot. Those are good points. If I may, um, some couple things I haven't heard um, mentioned as probably an old, probably one of the older people on here. I'm grateful I didn't have it. I'm glad my kids, we didn't let them have phones or to the internet until they were out of, out of um, high school. Very grateful, but a couple things I, that scare me is that people do not know how to interact with people. And I think that is detrimental. And I also see it creating, um, the use of phones creating um, a higher neglect of their children. 
I don't know how many times I see moms and dads on their phone, you know, doing this and not even acknowledging their children, you know, their bet, you know, they just want their attention, want their attention. Then they get upset because they've inter, you know, inter, uh, interrupted them or, you know, babies crying in their car seat and mom and dad are just ignoring. I think we will, we will reap the benefit or the, the consequences of that. I think it's really sad and it's really painful uh, to see that. Well, you're like my son-in-law. He told me he has a five-month-old and he said his, his five-month-old is not allowed to look at screens for five years. So that's what he said. <laughs> So anytime I'm sitting in the room, we're holding them watching TV. I have to turn them around. Anyway, he'll. I mean, the point is, he. I. I know he's going to be on screens. Um, it's just how it is. Um, but I think the point is, he. He you know he's he's aware of it and he's he's paying attention to it. Because we used to have books, we used to have TV. People, you know, people used to watch TV for twelve hours a day. And so in a way we've changed our screens. And I think if you use the the device as a tool, like you do your, you know, it's your camera, it's your radio, it's your it's your address book, it's your phone. It's just everything all encompassed in one device. Um so you know, you just have to make good use of it. But I think the thing to do is, you know, be aware of what you can fall into. And um I think I think I would encourage people this. I would say if you're an interesting person, people will put their device down and listen to you. If you're just blabbing away about just like nonsense, it's like, yeah, I'll go on my phone because like it's boring. But be an interesting person to the other person, listen, you know, talk about interesting things and you and people will listen to you. You know, people don't want to be on their phones all the time. But so many people just like I'm pretty introverted, and I hear a lot of a lot of stuff. Let's just put it that way. Let's continue on so I can um, be be mindful of my time commitment. Thanks for uh, being on late tonight, Aaron. How you doing? You're back there in the far east, Europe, or wherever you are. Ah, yes, the far east of the Midwest. Exactly. <laughs> um. Yeah, it's a quarter to midnight. I'm fortunate that I have home office day tomorrow. Otherwise, this wouldn't have flown for me. Okay. Well, it's our lucky day. Okay. So I think we did this part. More more friends don't mean you're more social. And you guys are making really good points. Thank you. And thank. I know I'm rushing it and covering a lot. And, and um you know, there's a lot of different viewpoints on a lot of this stuff. The primary cause of the increase in adolescent mental illness is frequent use of smartphones and other elect electronic devices. Less than two hours a day seems to, to be good. Doesn't, doesn't mess you up. But as adolescents who spend several hours a day interacting with screens, particularly if they start in their early teens or younger, have worse mental health outcomes than do adolescents who use these devices less and who spend more more time in face-to-face -face social interaction, just like you guys were saying. I think I've heard that the China's, China, they'll only let kids be on these things for, um, I mean, it's forced, but I think they have a, um, a one hour or two hour time limit in China. And I know it's forced and I know there's probably tons of cheating, but I, I mean, you know, the point's like, you know, you don't have to be on your phone all the time. Helping those who are hurting, that's really what we're here for. Medic medic medication versus psychotherapy. Medications, psychotherapy, and their combination are effective in helping people with emotional and behavior problems. The problem is depression. The preferred treatment is cognitive behavior therapy and interpersonal psych psychotherapy, possibly aug augmented by antidepressant medications. And the part you got to be careful of is the, the medications a little bit. My daughter had some issues in her life. And I, I learned to respect because I was really anti-prescription um, stuff. But I, I did learn that, that, that a lot of it does help people. 
And so that's one way that I expanded my horizon a little bit on depression. Anxiety disordered cognitive behavior therapy, antidepressant medications, and anti-anxiety medications. Schizophrenia or bipolar disorder is antipsychotic or mood stabilizing medications required cognitive behavior or family psychotherapy can improve functional outcomes. So it's pretty heavy duty stuff. A question on that. Yeah. Um, so I had a buddy who, um, who was a uh, pretty athletically uh, lenient and, uh, and, and I was, you know, in and out of that world myself. And there was a, a lot of discussion around what the relationship actually was between physical conditioning and how that affects a person's uh a mental development if uh you know, you're going through about like depression or anxiety and i was curious if uh, you'd ever come across any studies uh in putting in ex extrapolating this overview on if uh physical therapy or physical um conditioning uh played a factor in how people develop mentally as opposed to just leaning on medication yeah well, that's a big topic. I, I mean, just off the top of my head, I think if you're, if you exercise and you're healthier, eat you eat healthier, and you do healthy things, I think you're you're going to be healthier or more, you know, mentally balanced. Um, but I'm sure there's studies out there. Okay. So and I'm, okay, and I'm okay. sure not every in lean mean machine out there is perfectly mentally balanced um but i mean i just think your odds are better when you when you're healthy anyway, okay no problem without a supportive environment most people do not continue with necessary treatment so it's it's really important especially on your your inner world your close world your family your extended family just to have you know have some good support or if you lean too heavily on medication-centric treatments, uh, lacking critical psychotherapy. In other words, don't just don't just take the um, pills. Our our societies are filled with many emotionally hurting and isolated souls, and you know almost all of us have. None of us in this room are perfect, and so we all have a little bit of this in us and we're hurting in certain ways and, and in certain ways we're isolated. Large numbers of children step into adulthood unprepared for life as an adult, uh, especially children that receive disorder or moderating drugs that suppress their ability to learn and to socialize accordingly later in adulthood. In childhood overprotectiveness, tribalism, social media, and the lack of long-term continuous mental health assistance makes the situation far worse. And so to make the better world a better place, um, taking action be begins with each of, us each of us learning a little bit about all this stuff I just kind of um, tossed at you tonight. Um, but um, because there's more issues like like Liesl was sharing, you know, the kids in school, it's just out of control for teachers is, is maybe try to learn how you could help a teacher or help kids, help neighbor kids, help your own kids, and just figure out things that you can learn to, to, to try to influence your world. Taking action between begins with each of us as, as we interact with the world and focused on making the world a better place. And government programs cannot address these mounting challenges. They can help to a certain extent, but um, it's you know, it's people that have people in, in faith and spiritual walk and emotional health. <clears throat> they all uh, play a big part. Nonprofits and churches that are on the front lines in addressing social and mental poverty need our support, and where possible, our participation, <clears throat> and where possible, maybe our little grants or our big grants. Um, so that's the, um, that's the, um, product for tonight. Was this the book you were talking about? Somebody, the, the body keeps the score. Is that what you, some, um, yeah, what, that's the one yeah, that's the body keeping score. Yeah. And then when you, you know, if you go online, there's, you know, it's like everything you can learn a lot about stuff. Um, 
but yeah, we we we've had a lot of people tell us these two books are pretty good books. So um, for next week, which is really for two weeks from now, please make sure you worked on Poverty Inc. Please make sure you kind of dialed in on your grant and how that's going. If you need help, let us know. Uh, we only have <clears throat> two scheduled classes left. Um, and so we want to get everybody through on their grant presentations. If you if you want to present at the next class, um, when you email all your stuff in, just say, I'd like to present um, whatever date that is. That's the 26th. Um, just say, I'd be happy to share on the 26th. Sometimes we try to, you guys get did nice presentations tonight. Sometimes we try to put a little more of the paperwork online so people can see it. But you did fine. Um, we'll probably add 15 minutes to squeeze everybody in and um, three to four minutes is fine. And we're off next Sunday night. So anyway, we have a few minutes. <clears throat> and so if there's any questions, um, comments, the per, you know, it's all pretty heavy duty stuff. Um, you know, so you can't, is next week the last class or are we going into March? What's that? The two weeks from now? Yeah. No, there's one more after that. Okay, so it is. Okay. This is class. So why, why again is a class off the 19th? It's President's Weekend, Aaron. Right. And, I, and I know you'll be partying on Monday, so we we may not see you on Sunday night. So we want to see you. No, oh, you know me. I know. Always, always out there. No, when it's a holiday and it's a Monday, I know better. It's like, you know, people need to enjoy life, too. I know you guys enjoy life doing this, too. So, but anyway. Casey, how are you doing, Mr. Mercer? I'm doing all right. I'm I'm a little tired. I have a an old theater friend of mine that comes down from the Central Valley every year for Super Bowl and oh, okay. uh, so it's just been trying to host him all weekend and then trying to get on my um, issues with the computer, but doing all right. You're doing good. You're doing good. Sure. Did your team win? Um, I didn't really care. Oh, you didn't care. Not, yeah, I, I care less. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Most people are, are that way. It was a very good game, actually. It was um, unfortunate at the end. The um, the referee probably could have let a let a let a call go, but that's I, like I I needed that eight five score to go the other way, um, and it would have earned me some money. But you know, that's the way it goes. <laughs> There you go. Well, we have Gamblers Anonymous on Monday. <laughs> All right, Eric, you doing good? Doing great. Gio, you doing good? Doing good so far. Did you talk more to your dad about uh, his trip to Nigeria? I have not yet. Um, probably tomorrow. All right. Can you be friendly with your father, please? Yep. Okay. Well, I want you to do better. My speaker is not working properly. That's what it says all the time. Battery eighty percent. Thank you. LAP one nine five two. Okay, Lisa. Um, thanks for um putting up with us. I know you probably have. Um, I'm, I'm you do this for a living, right? Yes, I translate cognitive neuroscience for teachers. Ah, so what does that mean? Does that mean you're like a coach or a therapist or? Um, more of a consultant, so oh. I either will go in and do just like so a short workshop, or I'll be hired to like help reform the entire school or start new schools to oh. be aligned with how the brain actually works and learns. Oh, cool! You might more like what my friend does. He it's, he he calls it brain typing, okay. and that's the activity is like I'm an in, introverts um, work more in the back side of their brain mm -hmm. than instead of the front. And then we have right brain and left brain. And then we have, you know, everybody thinking they know what they are. And sometimes you reflect more your your parents than you actually, what, where your brain activity is. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, you got a yeah. big job. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one thing I've learned with my um, foster kids is just the amount of therapy it's going to take for them to uh, 
I mean, my my daughter and son in law are like gold, and you know they make good money. And I'm always looking at them. I go, man, life is such a razor thin thing where you could be a kid like my five year old or six year old foster boy, and he could either be in an abusive place, maybe living in a bar or whatever, or he's like skiing. I go, yeah. wow, what a different world. But he, you know, he needs lots of therapy. When my daughter first got him, he wouldn't even go in a bed because he'd never been in a bed. Yeah, a lot of untangling and rewiring to be done there. Uh, um, I'm curious. I, I, you know, it's interesting, like what you were saying earlier about, you know, people being addicted and on their phones. And if you're interesting, I, I noticed like, you know, I used to be a waiter. And right. I remember even back in, this is, you know, 13, 11 years ago, I, tables of people would come in and there'd be five six people and they would all be on their phones right and I, it would freak me out and then i transitioned and i was doing um last five years i've been doing interactive historical presentations at schools and like lisa yeah. said um there's been a change like we did a whole year where we were doing all of our presentations on zoom right and i could see the effect and um i i think there's also just something that's and Lisa, I think could really probably speak to this, that there's something that is definitely, um, it does something that help it triggers something in the brain. Am, am I right, Lisa, like with the, like the way the phone, the, like the, all that interacts. I mean, it, it says it's addictive, addictive, but I'm wondering what that is. Like, you know, when you smoke, it triggers a certain thing or whatever, you know what I mean? Sure, right. Like getting the likes and getting a new friend request mm. that definitely like triggers a, a release of dopamine that activates the reward centers that's, of the brain. You're like, oh, hey, look, like, somebody liked it. And then that was that the word I was like, it's the addiction loop. Yeah. That was the word I was looking for. I think I couldn't place it. I was like, I knew there was something there. Right, right on. Got it. Okay, everybody. Um, thanks so much for um, putting up with Super Bowl stuff. But I try to be a realist and make it work. So, and um, I'll send you a copy of all this and then one video to watch. Um, Veronica, any last minute comments from you? No, uh, if you guys have any questions on your organization review, we're here to assist. Um, just remember to send that